Again, I would like to thank those of you that are tuning in, uh, those that have tuned in on uh, multiple occasions, have enjoyed uh, the messages. Uh, we are located in Wilton, New Hampshire, Good News Bible Church on 27 Hutchinson Road, and we meet at 10 a.m. on Sundays, and we would love to have you come visit. If you do not have a church home, uh, please come and visit us and be blessed. Thank you. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, Matthew 16, 13. Caesarea Philippi was a city 120 miles north of Jerusalem and 20 miles north of the Sea of Galilee at the upper source of the Jordan near the base of Mount Hermon. It was the northern limit of the public ministry of Jesus. Its origins uh, or its original name was Baal Gad, that's out of Joshua eleven seventeen, or Baal Hermon, which is Judges 3, 3, or 1 Chronicles 5, 23, when it was a Canaanite sanctuary of Baal. It was afterwards called Panium or Panius and associated with the worship of the Greek fertility god named Pan. Pan was worshiped in the New Testament times and the people associated this fertility god with the source of water, being a spring that flowed from out of a cave and made up one of the three sources that fed the uh, waters of the Jordan River. This place was also known as the gates of hell because according to the beliefs of the worshipers of the god Pan, in the winter months, Pan would descend into the lower regions of the earth, which is considered hell. Therefore, this place was considered the gates of hell. Furthermore, in this place, Herod built a temple which he dedicated to Augustus Caesar. And this town was afterwards enlarged and embellished by Herod Philip the Tetrarch, of whose territory it formed a part of, and was called by him Caesarea Philippi. Partly after his own name and partly after that of the emperor, emperor Tiberius Caesar. So this place was not only a center of idol worship in the past, but represented the worship of the Roman Empire, which would later introduce the worship of emperors as being gods. So it was fitting for Jesus to bring the disciples to this place and ask them the most important question they would ever have to answer. Jesus was gauging the impact of his ministry and preparing the disciples for the kingdom that would be set up through the greatest spiritual institution known to man, the church. The answer to the, his question is key to the ministry of his church here on earth. And we pick this up in Matthew 16, 13 through 15, New King James Version. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I am? Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? See, God has given to man through the person of Jesus and the person of the Holy Spirit the gift of the church. In order for us to elaborate about the church, we must determine and expound on the founder of the church. So number one on your outline, the church is distinguished from all other social institutions because it is founded by and in the person of Jesus. Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ the son of the living God. Peter's statement concerning Jesus is the foundation that the church is built upon. It is not as some denomination state, which is that the church is built upon the apostle Peter or upon Mary or any other church patriarch. The New Testament church is built upon the statement Peter made that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, the rock. Colossians 1.18 says, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Letter A on your outline. 
The Apostle Peter's confession was the result of the Father's revelation. The Apostle Peter's confession was the result of the Heavenly Father's revelation to Peter. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Enlighten Peter to understand and say this statement that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Colossians 1, 15 through 20. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross." You see, within the person of Jesus is a revelation from God, which is the revelation of God. Remember, nothing has really changed over the years. When Jesus walked the earth and introduced the kingdom of heaven, this revelation shook the known world. The peoples living at that time grew up with idolatry, and false gods and reason and philosophy and myth and magic. In New Testament times, there were many gods being worshipped and many schools of thought concerning what truth is. And for most people, there were multiple beliefs as to life and death, heaven and hell, and what truth really meant. In an article written by Alexander S. Santrak, reaching the postmodern mind, he says that when postmodern philosophies and theologians speak about communal assent to truth, they emphasize cultural influence in our knowledge of truth. Truth is known exclusively within someone's community. The community's perspective is the only known truth. And this can be very, very frightening. And that is what Jesus was up against then. And that is what believers that make up the church are up against now. The quest for truth has been subject to reason and speculation of man's fallen nature. Satan did a great job in getting Eve to question God's word, and the result was eating the forbidden fruit that has become a wisdom for fools. And because man's quest, man questions the very word of God and has ever since the fall, he plunges himself further from the truth. And Satan's job of deception has never changed. He uses the same tactics. But Peter's confession is the foundational truth that the church stands on because it is the revelation of God to man that Jesus Christ is Lord. 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 6. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have re re renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants from Jesus, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Again, Alexander Sontrak, when Christians speak about community, we speak about communal understanding and appropriation of objective truth of God in scriptures. As a community, we do not accept pluralism of subject uh, subjective or cultural face as postmoderns do. Rather, we accept a one and only objective truth, that which is revealed in the Christ of the scriptures. And that is so liberating. It takes away all the confusion. It simplifies life that there is one truth 
that there is one mediator between man and God, and it's the person Jesus Christ, as Scripture says. And as Jesus proclaimed, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So let her be. The Apostle Peter's confession was the result of the continuance of the Lord's mission here on earth and into eternity. You see, the, the, the mission of Jesus was and is to bring men back to the knowledge and right standing with God, to bring them back to truth. Remember, Jesus told Pontius Pilate, the reason I have come is to testify to the truth. Christ's mission included bearing the wrath of God in his person, setting an example of how to live a godly life, teaching truth, and offering a self-sacrifice for the salvation of those who would trust in him. The very foundation of our Lord's mission was to recover from men their sonship, which is their relationship with God. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 14, the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, the Holy Spirit, that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. The man without the Holy Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. In other words, a dead person, a dead person spiritually, unless God awakens them, will refuse this knowledge, will fight this knowledge, will reject this knowledge of the truth that is in the person of Jesus Christ. Romans 16, 25, 27, Now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery hidden from long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all nations might believe and obey him. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen so that all nations might believe and obey him. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment. Why? To bring all things in heaven on earth together under one head, even Christ. Again, Alexander Santrak says, speaking about mystery, postmoderns view it as completely non-rational or even anti-rational. Ways of knowing become the ways of mysterious and institutional quests for the truth. Christians, on the other hand, do believe in the powers of reason and rationality in knowing the truth as it is in Christ Jesus. Jesus is a profound mystery indeed, but not a mystery that cannot be accepted by a person's reason. So this leads us to number two. The church is distinguished from all other social institutions because it is commissioned by Jesus. It's commissioned by Jesus. So, so the Lord says, and I also say to you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. It was not through Peter that the church would be built, as some den denominations say. He's but a man. It was Peter's confession of who Christ is. And this confession of Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God, would be the rock or the foundational truth that the church would be built upon. Remember that man in himself cannot prevail against the gates of hell. It would only be accomplished through the person and the power of Jesus. In fact, the word church, the Greek word for church, is used 115 times in the New Testament, mostly in the book of Acts, in the writings of the, of the Apostle Paul, in the general epistles. At least 92 times this word refers to a local congregation. The other references are to the church general or all believers everywhere for all ages. It means an assembly of Christians gathered together for worship, a company of Christians in a city or a village, or it means the whole body of Christians scattered throughout the earth. 
Also, the name is transferred to the assembly of faithful Christians already dead and received into heaven. The church, in essence, had its birth on the day of Pentecost. After the death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ was accomplished and the gift of the Holy Spirit was given. And we have a record of how the person of the Holy Spirit changed the hearts of the people and birthed the New Testament church. Acts 2.44. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continually daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And this leads us to letter A. The establishment of the church is in the Lord's prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And the church is our Lord's earthly Mission continued. The church is our Lord's earthly mission continued. Philip Schaefer says the history of the church is the rise and progress of the kingdom of heaven upon earth for the glory of God and the salvation of the world. It begins with the creation of Adam and with that promise of the serpent bruiser, which relieved the loss of paradise, of innocence, by the hope of future redemption from the curse of sin. Its proper starting point is in the incarnation of the eternal word, who dwelt among us and revealed his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And next to this, the miracle of the first Pentecost, when the church took her place as a Christian institution filled with the spirit of the glorified Redeemer and entrusted with the conversion of all nations. Jesus Christ, the God-man and Savior of the world, is the author of the new creation, the soul and the head of the church, which is his body and his bride. In his person and work lies all the fullness of the Godhead and of renewed humanity, the whole plan of redemption and the key of all history from the creation of man in the image of God to the resurrection of the body and to everlasting life. This is the objective conception of church history. Again, Ephesians 3, 1 through 7. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And this is how the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So this leads us to number three. The church is distinguished from all other social institutions because it is supernaturally empowered to be victorious. Let me say this again. The church is distinguished from all other social institutions because it is supernaturally empowered to be victorious. Now, when I mean church, I mean people that are truly born again, truly saved, truly filled with the Holy Spirit, truly walking in truth. They make up the true church of our Lord Jesus Christ. They are followers and disciples of of Jesus. They don't make up their own religion. They don't make up their own standards. They live by the teachings that are in the Bible. So the Lord said, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Against what? Against the church. Now, some scholars have interpreted this to mean that the onslaught of hell will never be able to destroy the church of Jesus. Something to consider is this, an attacking force never carries its city gates with them into battle. So this could not mean that Jesus was speaking of the defensive strength of the church. Besides, in ancient times, the gates of fortified cities were used to hold councils in and were usually places of great strength. This being true, then the meaning could be that neither the plots, the strategies, nor strength of Satan and his angels could ever prevail as to destroy the truce of Peter's confession, being that Jesus is both Lord and Savior. 
I will build my church. This speaks to the construction of the church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against us. And this speaks to the function of the church. Something that is often overlooked is the fact that Jesus promoted the church to be on the offensive, not the defensive. To understand this, we must look at what happens in the next several scriptures. And Luke gives us a more descriptive account of the events. Luke chapter 9, 28 through 36. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto the mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory in the two men standing with them. As the men were leaving, Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. And while he was speaking, a cloud appeared and enveloped them. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. Listen to him. I say to America, to our culture. Listen to him. Listen to Jesus. Listen to the teachings of Jesus. And he's the word of God. So listen to the Bible. Listen to what the Bible says. God's revealed will for men. It is because we are in the place we are in as a nation, as a people. It's because we don't listen to him. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone and the disciples kept this to themselves and told no one at that time what they had seen. Now, some theologians believe that the mountain was Hermon, Mount Hermon. Jesus gives Peter, James, and John a further revelation into the depths of the mystery being made known to them through the events that happened on that mountain. Now, it would have been great to bask in this revelation. And Peter wanted to make shelters. In a way, he didn't want this revelation and this glory to end. Peter was content to stay on the mountain and just worship. But letter A, the church of Jesus Christ is to be proactive, not reclusive, nor stagnant. The church of Jesus Christ is to be proactive, not reclusive, nor stagnant. The gospel of Jesus, the kingdom of heaven, the establishment of the church was never intended to be secluded from society and become a a fortress that is closed. The church of Jesus is to be the salt and light. And in order to be salt and light, then the church has to be engaged in its surroundings. To be a fisher of men, you must brave the elements of the sea with all its storms and all its dangers. In Jude 20 and 23, New Living Translation. But you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith. Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit and await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will bring you eternal life. In this way, you will keep yourself safe in God's love. And you must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment and show mercy to still others, but do so with great caution, hating the sin that contaminates their lives. From the temptation of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden through the temptation of Christ in the wilderness and down through the ages of assaults against the church, Satan appears as the antagonist of God, endeavoring to defeat the plan of redemption and the progress of Christ's kingdom. He uses weak and wicked men for his schemes, but is always defeated in the end by the superior wisdom of God. The central, current, and ultimate aim of universal history is the kingdom of God established by Jesus Christ. Remember again the words of Jesus. They were, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Matthew 17, 14, and 18. When they came to the crowds... This is when they came off the mountain. 
came back from the transfiguration, came back from that situation. They had to make it back down into the valley. And when they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of the boy and he was healed from that moment. Now, just watch how this unfolds. What is this hell whose power shall not prevail against the church? Its enemies are external and internal. How does the church overcome these? Let her be. The church is victorious by the exhibition of faith. The church is victorious by the exhibition of faith. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and they asked, why couldn't we drive it out? And he replied, because you have so little faith. I tell you the truth, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to the, this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. That's pretty powerful. It's actually amazing. Notice that Jesus came down from the mountain and entered into the territory of the enemy. He showed the disciples that it would be through their faith in him that they would be able to make a difference. And this leads us to number four. The church is distinguished from all other social institutions because it is sanctioned by the Holy Spirit. As we continue in the main text, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. The church must never sit back and build walls of seclusion and defense. The church was established by Jesus to take on the deceptions of Satan and hell and has been given the keys to heaven. What are these keys? What does this mean? Well, Colossians 1, 25 and 29, I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. This is Paul talking to the church at Colossae. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. Who are the saints? They're believers. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end, I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles to who? To the saints. Not some deified person. That's the wrong interpretation of a saint. That's what, what certain denominations do. They deify these people that are just like you and me. Same struggles, saved by amazing grace, empowered by the Holy Spirit to speak truth. And we're called saints. Believers, not deified people. We're sinners saved by grace, given a message of a mystery that's been kept hidden for ages and generations, but has now been revealed. And we get to continue the Lord's earthly ministry by disclosing to people the truth. The truth that salvation is through the person of Jesus Christ. The truth that, that there's only one way to heaven, and that's the man, Jesus Christ. The truth that his shed blood on the cross is a sacrifice that forgives us of all our sins. That in believing that and receiving the Holy Spirit, repenting of our sin, that we become the church. That we're then empowered by God to make known this mystery 
The proclamation means the preaching of the gospel, using words, testimonies, love, and actions. The admonishing means the warning, the, rebu the rebuke, the reprove, the caution, the correction. And the teaching is the instructing, training, equipping, encouraging, and sending, and partnering. Listen to this. New Living Translation, Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. He is the one who gave these gifts to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. And their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ, until we come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature and full grown in the Lord, measuring up to the full stature of Christ. So what happens when people do not understand what the church of Jesus is really all about? What do you get out of your church? What do you expect from your church? Why do you go to church? How do you see yourself blessing your church? And do you really understand your purpose in your church? There's a story told of two men, one named Jim Smith and the other man named Ron Jones. Jim went to church one Sunday morning and he heard the organist miss a note and he winced. He saw a teen talking when everyone else was praying. He felt certain the usher was watching to see what he put into the offering plate, and it made him boil. Five times by actual account, he caught the preacher in a slip of tongue mistakes. And during the invitation, he slipped out the side door, all the while muttering to himself, what a waste of time. Ron went to church also. He heard the pianist play an arrangement of A Mighty Fortress is Our God, and he was stirred to worship by the majesty of it. A special missions offering was received, and he was glad his church was doing what they could for the people around the world. He especially appreciated the sermon that Sunday. It really spoke to a need in his life. And he thought as he shook the preacher's hand and left, how can anyone come here and not feel the presence of the Lord? Both men were in the same church on the same day. Each found what he was looking for. It has been said that churches and banks are much alike in one respect. One, what one gets out is, for the most part, dependent on what one puts in. In this church, I witnessed one Sunday, an amazing Sunday. It was an amazing, one of the best Sunday services we have ever had. And people were stirred and people were crying and, and, and testimony. It was an amazing church service and people talked about it for weeks. But there was also a, a couple here that all they did was pick it apart. In fact, they pulled the elders aside to let them know how brutally wrong the service had been. It's amazing when you come here, when you go to any church, any service, and your heart is not right with God, you will not see what God is doing. They were here the same time. As the others that were blessed. And out of 150 people, two people left disgruntled, angry, bitter. They never saw God move because their hearts were not right. That's a shame. It's a real shame. Why do you come to church? You see, letter A, the reason followers of Jesus should be thankful for the church is because it is one of the greatest appointed avenues in which God reveals himself to man. What would happen if you viewed the church in the following way? This is my church. It is composed of people just like me. It will be friendly if I am. It will do a great work if I work. It will make generous gifts to many causes if I'm generous. It will bring others into its fellowship if I bring them. Its seats will be filled if I fill them. It will be a church of loyalty and love, of faith and service. If I who make it what it is and I'm filled with these... Therefore, with God's help, I dedicate myself to the task of being all these things I want my church to be. So many people come looking to in, in, in a church, and what can I get out of the church instead of coming into the church and saying, how can I use the gifts that God has given me to bless this fellowship? 
You see, letter B, we talked about this last week. The greatest offering you can give to the church is yourself. What would it look like if you practiced the calling of a Christian to offer yourself to God? You see, within the church, the central position is occupied by the altar. It stands in the most prominent place. And to this, there is attached a great meaning. The altar or communion table stands there to remind us that there can be no true worship without sacrifice. And that sacrifice is the central fact of worship and should be of our lives. Our true objective then in entering the house of God is not to hear a sermon. The pulpit ought not to occupy the central and dominating position. It is to offer unto God the sacrifices of praise and acceptable worship. Come unto his courts and bring an offering with you. Does not refer merely to material things. The chief offering is the offering of yourselves unto God. And without this, no other form of offering, however splendid, will make it acceptable unto him. It will be noticed also that our offerings, those which we give for the support of ministry and of the church, when received, are placed upon the altar. And they are placed there to remind us that they are an acknowledgement that our possessions are his. If one could read the history of each coin given in God's house, it would be found how many beautiful acts of sacrifice they represent. You see, the altar is there too, to remind us that no life can be lived in the spirit of Jesus, which is not sacrificial. Why? Because Jesus himself was a sacrifice. Oh, Father God. My prayer is that our church would reflect your glory. I know there are pastors right now, Father, they're pleading. They're praying that their congregations, the people that dwell within their local body called the church would continually offer themselves to you. Father, my prayer is that you will bless the churches. To glorify you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.